It's early. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> that is the best way to blow the Monday morning cobwebs out of your ears. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of Anderton's TV. And my guest today is Matt Schofield. How Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, we are going to talk about life, the universe and everything and your journey to, uh, you know, musical stardom. But yeah. uh, what, what's happening right now? Are you sort of mid-tour? I mid am. I'm uh, on my way back to the US uh, tomorrow. So I came over um, about 10 days ago or something like that and uh, went straight to Switzerland, a couple of gigs there, Germany, a uh, little thing in Holland. And then uh, here we are now, uh, about to dive I'm on my way to Heathrow. Dive basically. into Switzerland, yeah. see the bank manager, make sure all your hidden gold is okay. Yeah, yeah I wish. Excellent. I wish. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the gig tonight here. So, uh, yes, of course. Hope you guys, uh, by the time you've seen this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about you growing up. You are a, a, a Brit that um, has been well received in America. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But let's talk about. Back in the UK, whereabouts did you, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Manchester, um, uh, but I only lived there till I was seven. Right. So then uh, we moved down to uh, the Cotswolds. I was going to say, you don't have a Manchester accent. You have a Cotswolds no, accent. I still have, uh, still have hard vowels. So I said bath and glass. I could never get glass right. Fair enough. And, um, and I mean, so I was there till I was 18, but I was also going to the US every year. My dad uh, has been in uh, Northern California since... 1988. So I would spend um, the summer in uh, in Northern California. So it was always lots of uh, trekking around with that kind of thing. So per perfect uh, um, warm up for being a tour musician. Oh, I guess that's true. Um, and was it was it a musical family? Can you can you um, recollect listening to you know? Well, it was all my dad's records actually. So he's a big blues fan, and um, yeah, I mean, so he was. It had much more traditional stuff than I even know about still, really. A lot of the uh, great Delta um, acoustic stuff. And then all the way up to Muddy Waters, B.B. King and Freddie King. So that was the stuff that I kind of grew up here in. And I, I suppose even in the car, there was the compromise was like Eric Clapton, you know, so uh, for, the, for everyone to listen to. So it was always, always that kind of stuff. Um, so then once he was in the U.S., you know, I would... Um, I'd go out there and uh, tape his vinyls onto cassette, uh, cassette tape and bring him back to England. And uh, eventually I sort of thought, well, this is, I want to do what they're doing, you know. So. Was he a guitar player? He had a guitar around. Yeah. He's got one lick that, he, <laughs> that I've ever heard him play. It's like a little, you know, uh, <laughs> like a little blues turnaround or something. And um, so, no, he didn't, nobody really played music, but he... I will say he taught me to um, listen to music like a musician. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he'd put a BB King record on and he'd be like, listen to how the drummer's following BB mm. here, or like, listen to the bass line, or, you know, so he listened in and I was able to sort of uh, explore. And then when I, when I really got into it, it was because I had a BB King, he uh, left a VHS cassette of BB King. I think it's like 83, he's performing on the tube. Um, Oh, was it that was it the tube something like that British TV live from Newcastle Town Hall incredible gig you can go on YouTube and look Amazing. at it now you know because yeah. these days but I had it on VHS I was like man how can I do I couldn't you know figure out what he's doing it was really really hard to tell and because um, of course I knew some of the you know <laughs> cowboy chords and stuff but then BB's up here going and that's like, where do you even start to, I, I didn't know about the pentatonic or anything like that. And um, so I got bass first, because I thought maybe I could play uh, bass in, in his band, but I still wanted to be BB. Um, so I kept going back to it. And then I saw a video of BB sitting in with uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert Collins. And uh, um, I was like, okay, I gotta do it now. And somehow Stevie Ray sort of made it seem, um, more possible because BB's so majestic and it's so sophisticated in the music that you know um whereas Stevie's down there and he's playing in that uh you know the blues box position mm -hmm. it seemed like more obvious so um I'm surprised you uh you know I always found I always found uh BB King's at least superficially much more accessible than than Stevie's yeah, stuff maybe it was the stuff that I had because it was mm. from the 80s and his playing's 
by that point is you know he's dropping like sort of Django esque diminished lines and stuff on this but you know like really um, his Charlie Christian Django side wow. is coming out um, but yeah for whatever reason you know well, I think that's the thing with why Stevie Ray was such an influence for people of my generation playing guitar is he did sort of wrap it up into an accessible package that was at once both epic and mm. sort of doable hence the fact that there's been many many people who've sounded <laughs> a lot more like Stevie Ray Vaughan ever since than than BB it's harder to be BB than it is Stevie Ray yeah. even though the technical requirement perhaps is mm. and, and that's been the the fascinating thing uh, over now the last 30 years uh, BB was the package though wasn't it I mean yeah. he could sing it was just like you know whereas I always thought you know St Stevie voice Stevie got by as a singer yeah but was a Un insane guitar and BB was just like you could just listen to him you didn't have to be a guitar player to, to enjoy of course BB yeah yeah. Like I was, yeah that's and that's sort of the same with I'm a guitar player who sings you know um, but that's how I consider myself and uh, and I think that's become this, the same for a lot but yeah those guys BB and uh, Albert King too they they, they were entertainers mm. they were um, yeah. artists the full pack big band yeah. Very very sophisticated bands, you know, um, coming from really um, the jazz side of things mm. as well. That's the funny thing about BB is that, you know, the king of the blues is actually hugely influenced by jazz, and that's he wanted to project that kind of uh, sophistication. So. I've, I think the only interviews I've ever seen with BB, he always underplays or downplays totally. any kind of technical understanding of what it. Do you think that was that a myth? Do you think he was technically quite a cap not? You know, quite I've capable. seen uh, his um, tuition video that mm. he did, like, and he's got a guy asking him questions about what he does, but he knows where all the notes on the neck is. It, it's yeah, I think this it, it is certainly, and I got to spend a little bit of time with him, and he's incredibly was an incredibly humble guy. So yeah, I think he did downplay it a little bit, but mm. I don't think it was fake, um, you know, insincere kind of uh, humility. I think he really felt like that but he did he knew exactly what he's doing you know? good for him yeah so so we're it you know roughly how old were you then when when uh sort of that sense of you know starting to play guitar but then going you know i might do this you know as a like properly well i was 12 just turned 13 in and um uh, so it was summer of uh, it was august 1990 and i saw that video of stevie albert collins and bb and then actually Stevie Ray died like the week mm. later. So um, in my just turned 13 year old brain, I'm like, well, I definitely have to do it now, you know? So I actually went back to school that September, came back, to, I was in the California, so came back to school September and with some uh, friends of mine, I said, right, I'm starting a band. Uh, I'm the guitarist, who's playing bass, who's playing drums. So we all, we all started playing then and uh, did our first gig in April the following year, you know? And from that moment, we spent every minute after school and every minute on the weekends just jamming. And it always with a, a sort of a blues, you know, you didn't yeah. get sucked into the, I'm trying to think at the time, you know, Britpop and grunge would have been no. the two massive Yeah, it was like people at school know. listening to Nirvana yeah. and uh, Chili Peppers and then um, The Cure and stuff like yeah. that. Um, no, it was, um, you know, we were doing like some Hendrix, some Cream, some BB, some Howlin' Wolf, you know, it was like basically all, all of it Stevie. Um, yeah, so that was it. But, and the, the thing I've realized in hindsight is much of it was learned um, in the room with other human beings. So that's how most of my playing um, or most of my practice was done was always in the context of playing in a band. Mm. So we would spend every hour, and of course I'd go home and noodle around, but um, and that's in some ways continued to be the experience that I search out. Having to play solo like that right now and at ten thirty in the morning or whatever is like not what I do to me. <laughs> what I do is what happens tonight when there's um, a Hammond organ and uh, a, a great drummer and and you know like yeah. it, it's because it, I need that sort of feeding off the other musicians as well to, to hear something to play, yeah. you know. We, we had a, um, was one of the things, we had Marcus Miller on a few months ago and he was saying that's, you know, modern technology has allowed him as a working musician to just be sent files, do sure. his piece, drop it in. Yeah. And it's like, it's a wonderful 
convenient way of making a living and working. He said, but we're losing the, you know, you're losing that magic of what really makes musicians take it to the next level up is yeah. when they're all together in a room doing their thing. My newest record that I started last year is with Johnny and uh, Johnny Henderson and Evan Jenkins, who were on my first record uh, 15 years ago, and they're playing with me tonight. Um, and we went and found a studio last year with a big enough room that we could play all at the same time. And that's because it's like, you know, why, why are we trying to go around the houses mm -hmm. to recreate what we do in a studio when what we really do is all play together? So, yeah. so we, it was loud and uh, there's bleeding on all the tracks, you know, but it sounds like us. Yeah. So. Didn't, uh, didn't stop me liking any of the old Beatles and Rolling Stones. Right, right. like, uh, yeah. so, so at what point in your, you, were you getting formal tuition, you know, at this point? Or is it, are no, you largely no, self-taught? This is just, um, you know, listening to records. Wow. In fact, the only formal tuition I had was much earlier. It was about eight or nine in primary school. Uh, you know, and I had, so I had a nylon three-quarter size acoustic yeah. and the guy would come in once a week and we'd do like, London's burning, London's burning. Yeah, you had the same end. guitar school that I had. That was the extent of my guitar lessons. Easy G, they called it, right? One finger on the... Amazing. Uh, and um, so that's why... I, so I did know the cowboy chords. Other than that, so, um, yeah, I had... I think my mum had a best of the 60s cassette tape and Voodoo Child was on it. And I sat there and I was like... Like that, and then uh, I was like, "Oh, that kind of sounds like other blue stuff as mm -hmm. well." So I played it in the wrong position. So I was an octave up, you know. My um, did had no idea it was tuned to E flat. So I, I'm probably playing not, you know. I'm still yeah. figuring out. But I went. That sounds like blues. Yeah. All of a sudden, that was my yeah. first ever lick. So you know, you just start joining it up from there and um, then I realized that oh, I should... that's the position to play it in most of the time and and um, off we go you know so but again always then taking that back to my friends who were playing bass and drums and figuring out songs and then playing um, where I grew up in Fairford in Gloucestershire there's an air base right uh, it's, a, it's Royal Air Force Base but they um, would uh, I think they maybe they still do? It was occupied by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Air Force. So in Fairford, nobody knew about blues. We were like the only band in 1991 and two in Fairford. Um, but so during the first Gulf War, you know, that the, they would be 52s were coming over. So we used to get gigs on the airbase, playing in like the uh, the, 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 the big rec mess room. Hall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. To the Americans who all loved blues and rock and roll, you know. And also, I, as I recall, uh, they weren't subject to British licensing hours back then, you know, which was 11 o'clock yeah. done. So, you know, they would give us more money just to keep playing all night. So that was like our best gig. It happened to be right nearby where we grew up, but it was a whole room full of Americans who were like, it, more Stevie Ray! You must have had, because uh, I'm guessing you're still at school at this point, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you're doing playing till one in the morning on a military yeah. base. Yeah. And then what, having to go to school the next morning? Yeah, I, yeah basically... Um, you know, I mean, we did. Well, that, we weren't there every week or something, but we did it a fair few times. But um, and uh, but we were also doing gigs at school as well. So I mean, and so it must have been weird of of us playing, you know, Howling Wolf or something at, to uh, a room full of fourteen year olds. But yeah. we did it. Then they all came out. It was like, um, and once you get the taste for that, you know. So um, so it sort of sort of went from there. Really. And that, that was the bug, was it? And that, did, you, did your mum and dad try and talk you out of it? Or? No, I must say they've both been uh, I'm fabulously supportive the entire time. Um, so obviously my dad was into that music anyway, so it was kind of cool to him that I was playing it. And my mum, well, I'm sure she'd rather I've been a doctor or a lawyer or something. Um, it might have saved her a few, uh, <laughs> few pennies over the years on, on, the le on the lean months, you know. Um, but um, but no, she was always like, you got to do what you love. So I, I never had anything but um, great support from from both of them. And uh, you know, and then you realise, well, you know, my fortunate part of my playing is the fact that I've managed to get away with only only doing that my whole life. And you know, it's been more difficult than others sometimes. Um, 
you know, I moved to London when I was 19 and joined other blues bands with, uh, uh, you know, and that's where I met Evan, my drummer this evening and, uh, you know, playing in, uh, in bands in London and Johnny, my organ player, also grew up in Fairford. So he was in school. He wasn't in the, that band back then, mm -hmm. but he's a couple of years below me in school. Um, so I've sort of been, you know, I think about this when I'm teaching or doing clinics. It's like I've basically been able to fully engross myself in the journey of playing guitar. And obviously, if you have a family and a day job, then you get maybe an hour to get your guitar out and, and, and uh, practice. So that's it's a different experience for me than it is for a lot of people. And that's my I'm privileged to, to be able to do that. Uh, and but that comes with its own set of uh, harsh realities as well. Basically, choosing to be an artist for for a living. Yeah. Know, so. Well, and so from a timing perspective, you, uh, I'm interested. So your your sort of professional career starts around about the turn of the century, I guess, around about 2000, does it? Uh, yeah, 1997. Okay. I moved to uh, London. I was 19. So it's kind of just before, you know the digital music yeah. revolution. Yeah. You're also, I suppose, you know, one of a number of kind of like guys who were gonna get labeled as the next Stevie kind yeah, that of was, thing. Yeah, that was, everybody was looking yeah. for that, yeah. You know, and so what's that? I mean, they're two, they're two kind of separate questions, I guess. So let's do the, you know, what, what do you do when like everyone's looking for the next Stevie and all of a sudden, because you're playing the blues, you are, you know, yeah. Is on it a like, strat, you know? please, like, you know, how do you cope with that? Yeah, well, so, well, first of all, I just, when I first went to London, I just joined other bands. I just wanted to be a professional musician and tour and get the chance to play. I wasn't worried about a solo career or, you know, putting myself out there. So, and, and that was, again, sort of part of the learning process of being, be, being able to become the kind of player that I wanted to be. So then when I did start my own band, I did an organ trio because mm -hmm. um, I... I naively at the time thought that being different was good. It's not really. People want <laughs> something comfortable. So we did this organ trio, Johnny playing bass on the organ. It's quite jazzy. By that point, I should mention, some point later into my teens, having come from like BB and Albert King, Albert Collins, and, and, and then Hendrix and Stevie, I discovered jazz. I'd, heard, uh, I'd accidentally bought a Robin Ford record, I say accidentally, because I had no idea, and mm -hmm. I just thought, this looks cool, like used to go in and just browse through. I was, so that, I was like, holy crap, this is, what's, he, he's got a bunch of other stuff, I didn't know what's going on. Um, and um, turns out it was jazz. So, uh, which you really, you know, without the internet, like you say, back late 90s, it wasn't as easy to access stuff, and I didn't really know anyone who was into jazz, so... Um, he, you know, then I read a guitar player magazine interview and he says, oh, you've got to listen to Miles Davis, uh, Kind of Blue, um, you've got to check that out. So I did, you know, so mm. so by that point, I've got that side of things in there and uh, also New Orleans music, like the meters, funky, really funky stuff. So I was, okay, let's do an organ trio that kind of puts a little bit, it's still going to be a blues band, but it'll be really swinging yeah. and funky and jazzy. Uh, so we'll try and put all those together. Um, and so we made this little live record just to get some more gigs, 2003. And all the British, you know, I remember Blues Matters magazine, the, the review was horrible. Oh. They were like, I don't know, this is just jazz. These guys are, and I'm like, <laughs> no, it's, if you listen to B.B. King or if you listen to um, Albert King with an organ trio, and it, and it just, but it wasn't that, this is a yeah. long way of explaining, it wasn't Stevie Ray. Uh, and that's where back then things were certainly in, on the UK scene. It was either Stevie type Texas blues or, you know, harmonica players doing mm. more Chicago blues. So we were a bit of an oddity and, and organ trip people were always like, why don't you get a real bass player? And it's, I swear to God, after gigs, they were, where's the bass player? And it's like, well, these bass is a, a register of music. It's not just one instrument, you know? So it went, it, um, yeah. W but, I, well, I should say the guitar magazines, though, were very receptive, you yes. know, because they weren't as concerned about it being blues or jazz or whatever it was. So uh, they're just looking for they're just looking for an excuse not to put Jimi Hendrix on the cover of the magazine again. You know, they, yeah, they just yeah. it's like I think in fairness to guitarist magazines, they've always been like, you know, if there's somebody new and they're doing the, yeah. you know, and they can play. 
let's hear what they've got to say. You so, know? yeah, not to sound entirely negative about my beginnings with the, the lack of acceptance perhaps in the blues scene, the guitar community. Yeah. And still, to some degree, you know, that's carried on throughout the world for me now. So, you know, there's some artists that, um, that solidly work all the blues festivals in the world. And, um, and I don't get necessarily that many calls from some of those. Uh, they, they, I don't know what they still think I am, really, because I am in really blues, but I just, just kind of do my own version yeah. of it, you know? But so when I go other places, it's, it's often a guitar crowd yeah. more you, than the blues crowd. Did you, you know Robin, presumably? Yes, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he, that's the couple of times we've had him on, that's been his sort of career dilemma maybe for want of a better word is he sort of goes the, the blues community think I'm too jazzy and the jazz community think I'm too bluesy yeah. and I end up with this like yeah and of course his uh, his influence is the one that set me on that path and I now find myself uh, tarred with the same brush <laughs> <laughs> um, but guitar players don't care about it they just want to hear some cool tone and uh, yeah. you know so um, yeah and I, I will say you know now having spent my time driving around in a van in the US for nearly nine years, um, getting some miles under the belt. Um, I've started to reach into the blues community there, but um, you know, it's yeah, that's that's a different kind um, of different think, kind of scene, really. Uh, and I think you know, well done for you know doing your own thing because you, although at the beginning the Stevie thing was a it didn't last very long with no. you i think you know whereas other guitar players just can't shift it it's yeah. just like that's yeah. it it's just um yeah. so i wanted to not and then you know because i was back then of course like different times for gear as well even 2003 it was a, it was a different time than this um so i i would made my first two records and i only had one guitar right one pedal and one amp um and I made my first two records with just that. And but then they were good. It was yeah. my original sixty one strat and my sixty four super reverb and then Menatone Red Snapper. But um that was a different thing than, you know, so to to just um it was much simpler, you know, to not be uh caught up in the gear thing. But as we were talking earlier, you know, now that's become like a, a way out for artists such as myself as well into the world. Here we are now a guitar shop talking about stuff so um so that's uh that's become a new avenue again really not related to the blues at all it's just so happens that the blues yeah. is full of guitar playing so. well let's we we'll definitely definitely come back to that I, I i thought it was fascinating again we before the cameras were rolling your your career started really just at the turning point where uh, people were consuming music at, at first you know, illegally, you know, just the pirate thing yeah. was the, the challenge. Yeah. But now, you know, entirely legally, albeit still commercially not a great deal for the artist. <laughs> no, nothing at so, all for so people, yeah. Where, how do you, tell, well, let, you know, tell, tell us, you know, said that that first album is still probably, it, the, in the old fashioned way, was still the most. Yeah, when my first album came out, yeah, people were still buying CDs. So even though not many people knew about me, I probably sold more copies of that because more people actually bought physical stuff. And as, yeah. so as, as I got more well known, the sales of things go down, you know, so it's been yeah. like this. Um, so you have to find other ways. So in the old days, it was like you would tour, get a fan base. And then if you were good in a record label like you, you'd make a record. And so, and then you made money from the record and you toured to promote your, your record. So then it became, you have to make a record to get gigs now, because everybody's got a record. Yeah. So it, that, first of all, was the first thing to flip. Everybody's got uh, an album, because it's easy. And first, that was the first stage, actually, as if um, in the 90s, everybody could start going to a studio, pressing a CD independently. Now we want to hear your record to give you a gig. Um, so then as that moved on, um, then everybody stopped buying physical media, pretty much. So then you're driving around in a van to try and make money, but overheads on touring, mm. you know, and it does affect things creatively because um, I didn't necessarily want to just have a trio for the rest of my life. I always wanted to ultimately have, be like B.B. King in front of my big band so I can just come out and go, you know, that's, but that's a lot of mouths to feed, yeah. you know, and What's so. The, what do you think the overhead per night on 
you know, you've got to be doing five to ten thousand pound a night just on an overhead, e- easily, just to sort of easily. So, and, and I mean, and at the same time, the cost of living has gone up yeah. all over the world while while I've been doing this. So try getting a hotel room in New York City that you would be happy to sleep in um, for less than three, four hundred dollars a night. Do you know what I mean? And so that's just one person. So you add that up. Yeah. This is this is, and then you do the maths about. Um, ticket prices and, and yeah. flights flying about and gear you got to rent some gear so again things like working with great companies I flew to uh, Finland last year and uh, Harry here my friend from Mad Professor sets me up with a full back line you know nice Mad Professor amp and um, because otherwise unlike having to rent stuff and you know so all those tie-ins you have to pull it all together like that these so days so how do you you know Without wanting to put all you guys off of ever trying to forge a career as a professional musician, you can't make any money out of selling the, the, the albums. Uh, touring's too expensive to make any money, at least at kind of, you know, if you're playing to you know, two or 300 people sure. or whatever. Yeah. Um, but well, you're still here, and it doesn't, it looks like you've eat, you know, you're still eating. And, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, I am living in the US now, and it definitely starts adding up those big, big portions. So, so what do you do? How do you, um, you know, how yeah, do you make well, it lately, work? Lately, um, you know, one of the biggest things for me has been uh, working with Truefire, the, yeah. the uh, online lessons. I've done two courses for them in the in the last year, and you know that's um, really great uh, intellectual uh, property that I can still get paid for. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's been wonderful. They've, they, and everything's great about the whole thing. Everybody's great at what they do. Great company to work with, and the response has been great to the lessons. But um, it's like so that's actually a payoff. It's not the one I expected, but the driving around in the van all these years thing, um, the payoff has been that now I can explain my playing. I wouldn't have been able to do it the same 10 or 15 mm. years ago and just do lessons. But what I can feel like I can offer on the True Fight thing now is, is, a, is a certain perspective and a certain style of teaching. So that's been a game changer for a lot of us. Mm. And that's why Robin has courses on there and Larry Carlton and David Grissom, they've all they all do courses for uh, for True Fire because honestly, it means that we don't have to be in a van as much. Is there uh, <laughs> presumably though? There's no shortcut, and if anything, now you know, unless you're I don't know, incredibly lucky to hit a vein of something really takes off you, big poppy song or something like that. Yeah, you've just got to put the miles in and accept that for ten years of your life, whilst you hone your craft and build a fan base, it's just gonna be a little bit hand to mouth yeah know? it is and it's still it really it still is hand to mouth not as hard as it used to be but it still is there's mm. very little you know job security here and and um, you know I go home and uh, you know I was lucky enough um, to finally be a homeowner I got a little little condo in, in Jupiter Florida in, in the US beautiful thanks to my manager who uh, is good at that kind of stuff because you know that's a whole you know, property. I got no idea. You know, but I had an opportunity very affordably to have a very nice place to live. And um, but I go home and I still just do little local gigs for for um, not advertised, not you know. And I'm just playing a bit of guitar with some friends. But it's, it's still a bit of money when you're not touring mm. and uh, keeps the fingers going. You know, so um, it's not like we go out on tour, earn a million mm. uh, dollars, and then go and sit in our um, penthouse or something it's st- it's yeah it still is everybody's having to work you know you you have played and you are re- still regularly asked to play um as part of these kind of epic guitar lineups <laughs> yeah. um tell us about you know which of those have blown your mind the most and uh yeah i mean um well one one time i did the a few years ago did the um at uh, Guitar Town Festival in Colorado and for the final jam let me try and picture the stage it went John Jorgensen Sonny Landreth Robin Ford Steve Vai <laughs> <laughs> me um, and a couple of other fellows whose names I've forgotten that I wasn't that familiar with there Steve's like, the fish out of water there isn't he you know he doesn't but, play a lot of blues does he but, it so. was it was super, and we did like a clinic as well yeah. all of us sat in a row you know um, and like, sometimes you just like how did I end up here you know this is um, so that was that was an odd one and uh, you know I've got I've got my two rock rig at that time it was 50 watt 
and a 410, you know, wheel it out on the flight case for the final jam. But I find myself right next to Steve, and he's got that massive the stereo carving, carving thing, yeah. two 412s there, yeah. and then his floor wedges, uh, actually guitar cabs as well. So he's got like quadraphonic, <laughs> that's what's going on. So he stands in the middle, because he's got two 212s firing back at him, and two four, and I'm like, all right, I guess I'm just gonna, hopefully I can hear through something through this, you know, with his band doing the, what did we do? Like, I don't know, Red I bet it was Jimmy Hendrix. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe Little Wing, even something. But yeah, that's great. And then other ones are different than that. Like a lot of times I'll play, went to Japan, for example, with uh, Josh Smith and Kirk Fletcher. Yeah. And we always, we always have a good time. What a trio together. of talent there. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's really fun. And, you know, we're, um, we're all kind of cut from the same cloth, really, and, and grew up on the same stuff and have a lot of similar frames of reference. And everybody's gone their own little way of interpreting it. But um, it's really fun to, uh, to do that. So that's more like... Uh, more like a hang than a, than the finding yourself was up was with there a, was there a, do you still get butterflies and stuff like that or is was, no is that I your, never did even never my first did. ever gig the desire to play in fact I, I'm most nervous when you say to me play something by yourself <laughs> now that's like the worst thing but if I actually go out and do what I do yeah um, I've never never been nervous on a gig and um, certainly I remember the first time I went to the NAMM show probably ten years ago or something. I'm walking around and I'm like, man, there's so many good players, you know. What? And then, it, it, so at first that's sort of intimidating, but then I re I'm like, but I can I can only play how I play. Mm -hmm. Like that's the only thing I can do. I'm not versatile. I'm not a good session guitarist. That's another story. Okay. I mean, I abandoned that when I came to London um, because I couldn't play what somebody wanted me to play at that. I can only play what I think of in my mind and then it comes out at any time, you know. I, I I'm, can't even play my own solos again, really. <laughs> and so it's a strength and a weakness, you know. It's like, but, um, so I was a rubbish session guitarist, but then I realized, listening to all these guys, that, um, well, I, I can only be the, the best Matt Schofield. Yeah. And, um, and nobody can do that either, other than me. So then, then um, once you stop worrying about impressing people and you play the music for the sake of the music and just because it you want to make it sound good then all that disappears and you don't, I don't it's not even a concern anymore because i realize after 29 years of playing my playing is a product of me making it how i want it to sound and it's not like oh if i could change what i do to be more like someone else mm -hmm. i'd make do you know what i mean it's like no this is this is the process that I've, mm. this is where I've arrived with you, it, so. I can understand you, I can definitely understand getting to that sort of point of maturity where you just go, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like that person or that person. Yeah. And I think pretty much every guitarist I've ever interviewed very, you know, doesn't, very quickly sort of just goes, look, I am what I am, I don't sure. want. But in terms of a genre, do you still, you know, do you still find genres that you're not, uh, familiar with exciting you know you still do you still maybe look at I don't know I'm thinking of whether or not you go a bit more hardcore kind of country or a bit more jazz you know do you sort of think oh yeah do you know what? I'd love to do an album of yeah, X I, not so much for me I mean it just like I say it is what comes out is what comes out mm -hmm. with me and uh, in that respect I am a blues guy in my mind in the same way as the, the old guys were it's like what I'm more interested in like almost like refining the artist mm. that I am. Like BB was just always BB King, you know. Now you can, I like playing with different lineups and different settings of the band and stuff, but um, no, I'm not really interested in getting my country licks together or, it, and that's, that's just not the, the kind of art that I pursue with the guitar. I just pursue being me more and more. And that's really the thing, it goes back to that video of BB Stevie, and Albert Collins, is they are all stood there together playing a slow blues, well, Texas Flood, and uh, they all sound completely different, mm. but they're all playing the blues. But you couldn't find three more different sounds. And that was the thing right from the start for me. I was like, so if I found myself up there with them, it's no good sounding just like one of them. You know, I have to put it all together yeah. and then have something to say myself so that's really been the process is like finding something to say uh, yeah. with the instrument 
So, no, you're not going to get a country record for me because uh, I don't feel like that's what I have to say. If, and that's, that's why. It's but, fine. But I do see... I wasn't angling for no, you No, no, no. It. But it's a, good, it's a good point, though. But I, uh, I do enjoy listening to lots of other kinds yeah. of music. In fact, you know, I listen to a lot of jazz, a lot of funk. I listen to a lot of stuff that doesn't have guitar on it. I, you know, like my favourite guitar players are my favourite guitar players, but I listen to lots of Stevie Wonder and Donny Hathaway, which is not mm. really guitar-centric in any way. Um, because I like music, really, more than anything, I, you know, and I love the blues the most, but what I really love is music, so. Oh, that's cool. Well, look, we touched a little bit on gear, and as we are a music store, yes. and this is predominantly a gear channel, we should probably take that trip down memory lane and bring bring up to date. So you you talked about this, your first album being a 61 Strat, Super Reverb, and mm. one pedal. Yes. I, I love it. You yes. know, there's there's a there's a but but I'm never going to retire off of customers like that. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> obviously, I, let's talk about the the, the the gear journey and kind of what you, you, have you you've been a Strat guy? Well, forever? actually, I think I uh, Strat. I think I went off my own point earlier when I was <laughs> explaining that because when I had when I mentioned the 61 Strat and the Super Reverb, um, I did have then a brief journey with. To, to try and avoid the Stevie Ray thing even more. Right. Because, so I'm 25 years old, I got a Sunburst Strat that's starting to get beaten up and a Super Reverb and basically yeah. like a cheap Cowboy boots? Or did you, yeah, yeah I st probably. but I still love my cowboy <laughs> boots. Uh, um, but, um, and uh, man, the strap, I, I, it's in my guitar case, but, you know, I, I love all that stuff still, but um, I think you can absorb it and still be yourself um, like Stevie did with Hendrix, you know? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, my strap was a gift from the guy that made Stevie's last strap that I'm using uh, at the moment, and it was a, that's such an amazing gift. I got it at the Dallas Guitar Show. Anyway, I was um, so I thought oh, I'll try try and avoid that. So I played my uh, it's a Tokai 335 actually. Okay. It was a non-export uh, Japanese one. Um, it's great, great guitar. Mm. But that's at my mum's house in Manchester now. I haven't seen it in quite a while. Uh, and uh, Simon Law, who now is responsible for these guitars for me, had a 68 telly that was just great. Um, but then that was a blonde telly with a rosewood neck, and I'm like, well, I can play that, and everybody's going to say you sound like Robert Ford. <laughs> because I, there was both influences of mine, and I, in some ways that was, to me, would be like the ultimate guitar player if you put Stevie and Robin together. So this is all, and I'm 25 years old, yeah. so you're still sort of processing all of that. So in the end, it was good playing the other guitars and to come back to the Strat and definitely not sound like Stevie Ray on a Strat. Yeah. So I was quite pleased I could do that. Um, so everything since is in some ways still been sort of based on that same rig, you know, and I've got a couple more things these days, but it's the, it's the same principle. As yeah. Let's, uh, we'll get to the pedals in a minute. Because yeah. the, the pedals, I think, you know, will be... An accessible thing for, for everybody watching this but we'll talk about the amp for a minute you, you've got this super reverb loud traditional in your face fender sound yeah and of course you you know long time uh relationship with the guys at two rock yeah absolutely. but i'm i love how guitar players answer the question of so let's talk about this idea that you've basically got to be good to get those guitar amps to sound good. Well, yeah. You know, and yet, and amps that, for us mere mortals, that will sound a bit more forgiving, just aren't your, they don't give you what you want. So can, can you yeah, explain that? Well, it's a lot of it's to do with headroom, really, you know, and um, so I want to be able to determine where the amp, uh, where the limits of the, the sound and playing are. So with a smaller, low wattage amp, that very, quickly puts a ceiling on your dynamic range, you know? But playing for me is all about getting as much dynamics out of That's the, the details mm -hmm. that maybe you don't really notice when you listen to a really good blues player, but that's the what that's what's going on with the ones that sound really mm -hmm. good. It's like just little being able to go. You know, like some notes stronger mm -hmm. than others, some notes softer and, and so you really need some headroom to reproduce that because if the power section of an, of an amplifier is compressing it just flattens all that out so the feeling for me of running out of headroom on a gig is a disaster mm. um, so then you have to basically 
learn to manage a powerful amplifier and it's it's like they say with great power comes great responsibility and um, I liked your car analogy the analogy earlier. yeah it's so yeah. it's if you get if you're not an experienced driver and you get in a very very powerful you know this things with a thousand horsepower these days and you would just put your foot flat on the floor you're just going to slam into the first wall mm. that comes past you'll be going too you can't control it you know uh, so it is it's like having a very powerful car you have to drive it carefully otherwise you'll crash yeah and it's headroom is it's that it's like i like a v8 engine basically <laughs> so i like 50 100 and in the case of uh, the latest two rock uh, that, that i uh, got is 150 watts it's not about volume though i mean i am yes. i'm loud yeah 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 i'm loud but it's it's not like mashing on the you can make anything sound bad if you just like <laughs> You know, it's finessing it. You know, and like pulling the the tones out of the guitar with how you play it. And, uh, you know, most of the time I'm not on not on ten most okay. of the time. Uh, even in a solo, I might have the drive on, but the guitar's on seven maybe to start out, mm. and then j as it builds and. You know, the band plays with a lot of dynamics as well. That's very important. We're not, so it's not like a big amp flat out all night and the band mashing on it. We go up and down. It's very, yeah. so that's why it's like using a powerful car to get through the turns and stuff, but you have to finesse it. I, I so, think as a, as like the sort of, as far as the sort of general public guitar player is concerned, that that, we tend to go in waves of like, what what what, what is it that's cool? And I, I think, for the last probably 20 years or whatever, it's been this like low valve, low low wattage valve amplifier that, you know, push the power section, that's how you get the good tones. Yeah. And in the last year or two, it just feels to me like people people are beginning to look at the 100 watt amplifier again, not as, oh, it's unbelievably loud and that sort of, more as just something, as you say, it's just got this huge dynamic range. Yeah, and, yeah. And if you want to have everything from a whisper to a scream, that's just what you need. And, it's and, not about volume as such. Yeah, know. and I sort of need to know the size mm. of that dynamic range, mm. you know. And uh, yeah, it isn't. It, it's it's still loud, but mm. there's a way to make it. So, and then it's also dialing your stuff in mm. properly. It, you know, having a good guitar helps a lot, so that it's nice and resonant. And you know, there's yeah, there's, you got to get get a lot of harmonics uh, into the sound. Um, so the amp has to be rich sounding if it's loud it's mm. loud and harsh is not good right so that's but loud and warm and fat that's a, that's how most of the great guitar tones that we listen to from the past were really loud you know hendrix with three full marshall super lead stacks I yeah mean, that's loud that's pretty loud um let's just We'll talk about the pedals in a minute, but let's just give a shout out. We should really thank uh, the guys at Reunion Blues and Kurt Mangan for kind of organizing today. Yeah. Um, Reunion Blues make beautiful gig bags. Uh, and I guess I'm not gonna try and do a hard sell on a gig bag here. It's like, I'm guessing it doesn't really <laughs> affect how you sound at night. No, but um, it does affect, I will tell you, this is a true story and this is the best, um, you know, I carry my guitar on in the US and the, the law there says that you can, mm -hmm. but you know, it's always a fight to get it on a plane. Yeah. And, uh, and there's been times where they just simply won't say what well, you can't do it or yeah. it's full, you're too late getting on and you have to gate check it. And of course they're supposed to give it back to you when you get off the plane with like the yes. prams and stuff, you know? Um, and often they don't and it goes down to the carousel. Um, that's happened before and I, I can honestly say that's the only gig bag that I would not yeah. be completely panicking yeah. out of my mind. It'll survive a baggage handler, maybe, maybe yeah. not being driven over by a uh, low, by one of the carts, but it will survive yeah. whatever you can throw it. Let's put it that way, and that's absolutely true. I've had that happen. Well, and we're all myself and Pete. We're all fans of of those bags. I guess the strings probably have a, a, a slightly more tangible uh, effect on tone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, where, what was the attraction with going over to, to the Kurt Mangan strings? Um, I've been with him like I think at least ten years now, so we're no, nobody heard about him. And, wow, um, yeah. For me, I was searching around, uh, been buying like 
hodgepodge sets to get the gauges I wanted. Yeah. So I was often buying a regular 11 set and throwing away the low E. And um, so, you know, I wanted to uh, lessen my um, the carbon footprint maybe by the, <laughs> or whatever, you know, like it was very wasteful. No, no, I just wanted to be able to get a set. So I remember finding Kurt's website. I thought, well, I'll give him a try because he, you could order any set mm -hmm. that you wanted with whatever gauges, right. you know. So I like a 54 on the bottom to um, be able to do that or just... Nice. You in concert pitch, you in E yeah. or E flat? E. e yeah, so you're playing some, you know, yeah, 11, proper man strings it's here. A, it's a regular 11 set, but um, with a 54 on the bottom. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, mm. so sometimes I, now that I'm into my 40s, I occasionally think about, maybe I'm going to try one of those <laughs> 10 and a half sets on some nights. But the problem is, and right now sat here, I have to work a bit more but as soon as the adrenaline's in on a gig yeah. i don't think about it and then, then i'd be off the side yeah. of the fretboard if i if i had anything lighter um but basically i discovered because i could order a set of mm -hmm. whatever gauges i wanted and then i was like these are really great strings um so i just kept doing that and at some point i started talking to kurt and then uh, actually my first ever visit to the nam show was was with him and so we talked about actually releasing the mm. signature set for people that might want to do that, and uh, here we are now. And the other thing I could say, up until July, I could say I'd never broke, I'd never broken a string on a gig since I've been using them. Wow. Um, but I did have my first breakage. Just so you know, this endorsement is on. <laughs> I did break one in July in Italy, but it was the third gig on that set, and I'm two at the most, usually most, mm. most gigs I change them. But we'd had a terrible travel day, and. And then they'd lost this guitar for 24 hours and then I got it back and then, you know, so I had to, we got out and basically had to get out of the van and play and um, didn't get a chance to change them. So it, I can I can get at least two gigs. The third gig, I did break the high E, but that's one in like 11 years. It's pretty, it's pretty good. good, right? I've, I've got to say, you know, strings is something that I'm a little bit uh, cynical about, but... I played Dan Steinhardt's telly about a year ago and uh, I did say to him, I said, what strings are these, yeah. Dan? You know, it's like, they actually feel pretty good and different. And, and anyway, they were, I, I don't know what gauge they were, but they were Kurt Mangan strings and they definitely, they've got a thing, you know, so. Yeah, it's anyway. not, it's not like reinventing the wheel, no. but you, they, they're just nice yep. and well made and yep. consistent. And so, you know, what's not to like? Well, let's talk about then the Mad Professor thing because, of course, Mad Professor is an, is another uh, brand that, where you've got a signature product. Yeah, with them. yeah. Uh, so we've got uh, a very simple board on the floor here, um, yeah. which hopefully you guys are seeing at the moment. Um, tuner, delay, funny little red thing that you can explain, yeah. and of course your Supreme. Yes. Um, and then we've got an extra special Mad Professor treat for you with a world exclusive. <laughs> Um, which we'll come to in a minute. Yeah. So tell us about your... Is this, is this an actual touring board for you? Yeah, this is my this board. Is this the is board. my touring board. And for actually, I only put this together like last month. I didn't even have a board for the last year. I had just the Supreme on the floor or Supreme in a tuner and I had the delay back on top of the amp. Yeah. Um, because I, you know... Um, well, Dan, uh, a couple of years ago, made me a big, beautiful board with the yep. gig rig uh, quartermaster yep. and it was wonderful but the, it, he sort of put himself out of a job with me because <laughs> then all of a sudden I heard like basically when you everything's out of the circuit and I was like that sounds so much better doesn't it like we used to be plugged into the amp yeah. so um so I kind of went oh like I've come full circle and I want to get rid of it all and just get it down to the very minimum and then I started talking to uh, my friend Harry over there at uh, Mad Professor because I was like if I could get everything into one pedal the two sort of amounts of drive I need then I would be down to one pedal um, so um, Do you, is, is a part of this pedal also that if you're doing fly gigs and festivals and stuff that the backline rental could be anything or, or yeah I mean luckily I don't have to deal with that too much these days because um, you know Two Rock and their distributors often take care of me wherever I am. So I don't. But I did use end up using some backline just mm -hmm. the other week. And um, um, 
Yeah, there's a little bit of that. Although I did for a while, I did try a different solution to that with like the Kingsley uh, Maiden preamp. Mm. So I'd mm. use this into the Maiden, and then into out of like a stereo reverb into the effects returns of a pair of Devilles or yep. something. Yeah. And that was so you're taking the preamp out of it, and the Maiden that I had is like a full blackface mm -hmm. preamp. That was good, but. Um, yeah, carrying around the least amount of stuff possible is definitely part of it. But also just not having like loads of stuff to to think about. I, I just want to play guitar, and I don't want to be tap, tap dancing. I don't want to be troubleshooting like, oh god, what's gone wrong now? Yeah. What's buzzing? What's humming? You know. So uh, yeah, well, let's talk us through this. My my favorite thing about mm. this board. Yeah. Is. Um, so you guys will probably be looking at this going, that's a bit weird. Why'd you plug into the delay before you plug into the distortion pedal? And of course, you're not doing that. Underneath the board, you're going tuna, um, tuna drive pedal. Tuna, supreme, delay, tremolo, tremolo. out. So. But because it, you were saying, because just this is all about keeping things simple, you just want the pedal board just slightly off to the right of your mic stand, and so you just want to be able to plug, bass, stomp yeah. on. Yeah, so that goes on, that stays on all time. <laughs> So, you know, I could basically, and this is a tremolo, which is, I have one tremolo sound. So that's Henretta Engineering made that. Uh, it's got trim pots. So it's just preset, one tremolo sound. I could even have uh, the same thing with the delay, really. I, that never gets turned on and off. So th I just put them out of the way because that I do press several times in, in uh, every song. So yeah, it's just, and I'm not looking, I got my eyes shut. It's sweaty the lights are bright i can just like know that that's yeah. there without and even thinking about so it so the, the two buttons are what two sides of a of a gain yeah pedal? so we've got on and off right uh, so there's our straight uh our little straight amp sound and then uh that turns it on and we're on the a side on the left side which mm -hmm. is uh, like the um I was using the Mad Professor Royal Blue overdrive yes. for uh, for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a great dynamic drive. So that goes from the straight amp to uh, so a little little hair, little thickness. Sounds great, man. Th that's all the way up. So it's really dynamic. You can play like on six or seven and get like a. Get a cleaner, different clean sound mm. than. It's about the same amount of gain, but it's, it's just a. So there's loads of flavors mm. in there. So you. Yeah, and this is the whole thing with the rig to me. So we've got that high headroom amp. I'm using the volume control all the time and mm. trying to, you know, I adjust it constantly on a gig to make that note a bit fatter than the other ones or make this one sing a bit more. It's like trying to really play the equipment that you're using. And then this side, well, um, I had the man Professor Twimble, mm -hmm. which is sort of their take on the, on the overdrive channel yeah. of, a, of a Dumble amplifier. But uh, it has a wonderful texture to the, overdrive like really amp like and, and dynamic but for me it was a bit too compressed the head yeah. again he not enough headroom so i would lay i would flick from the royal blue to the um to the symbol twimble twimble symbol yeah either one and uh, <laughs> and it would you i'd get the gain boost and the eq that i wanted but it would make it smaller compared right. to the rest of my rig yeah so i said got talking with harry and i'm like right could we do something with the royal blue that I can hit one? Because you could. This isn't stacking. Right. This is switching from side to side. I see. You can stack yep. it. The little switch in the middle goes, lets you stack them. But I wanted something one press, and it will go to the the next level of gain. Yeah. So then, uh, the the mad professor fellas went back and uh, got to work with uh, the team and came up with the. A, a high headroom version of uh, of the that kind of tone, but in the end, it's almost uh, goes back a little bit into like a 
cranked super lean yeah. sort of sound than than just the dumbly sound it's uh, but it it's that sort of tailored to the bridge pickup right so this one i can use with either the neck or the bridge <laughs> Um, and you know, tone control down a bit on the bridge pick. A bit more Albert Collins, and then this one brings like the low mids back in, and you get. So, uh, and that's got a fair amount of. Bit, fair amount of drive on it, but not it's not compressed, so the, it's still it's great. So, I really want to sound like it's that getting that thing when you've stood next to a really great tenor saxophone player, okay. and I mean a really great one. The first time this happened to me was we were, my trio, same band as tonight. We were back, backing up uh, Pee Wee Ellis that played with James Brown, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we did a set, and I've got a 100-watt two-rock head and four ten. This is like 2007, so I'm thinking my tone's really big. I'm fat. And then Pee Wee comes out on the second set, and he's like two feet off the microphone with the tenor sax, and he just hits this note, and it, the whole thing resonates, and you can hear it through a Hammond organ, and it makes my guitar sound sound like this. And I'm like, that's a real resonant acoustic instrument. Yeah. And the dynamic range that he has, because he can play it as well. Yeah. I was like, so I've always been trying to work more towards that and so that the notes keep yeah. blooming rather than squished down. So uh, th this one's got... Uh, and a little bit of tone off on the... Bridge. Do you know a guy called Chris Buck? Uh, yes, I know of, of him. I've met, met once. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, he's a younger guy, but he's definitely been influenced by you. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, can, I would agree with that. He, yeah, <laughs> There's a few of them around these yeah. days. I've, um, I've found it's a, it's a strange thing, really, you know, because like, like, you go from the up-and-coming mm. young blues guy, and then somehow you if you stick at it long enough and stick around and pursue a sound of your own yeah then you sort of somehow now i'm like a veteran 42 and i'm uh, but i didn't have the glory years in the middle <laughs> of the 10 10 million records you know so i've passed as passed from up and coming to in in the lexicon of the sounds that you hear other people using yeah. you know and uh, uh, still, just still driving around in a van. <laughs> I think j just the fact that you have a recognisable sound is very, very few guitar players get to that level where you can go. That's the one, though, man. Know. For me, that is the thing. Like mm -hmm. I said, with that video of Steve, it was like, um, you know, and I've, I like paying, like I like the nods to my influences still, mm -hmm. and I think that's why Stevie Ray was great, is because he sounded like hundred percent like Stevie Ray. Um, but he was, you could tell it was some Jimmy, some Albert King, Lonnie Mack. Nobody ever mentions Lonnie Mack. For sure. But that was Stevie's, the third part of Stevie was Lonnie Mack. Um, but it's like now, so I've been playing 30 years next year, and it's now I spend more time thinking about what kind of player I want to be for the next 30 years if I'm lucky enough to be on the planet. And, uh, then the next step, the end level boss, as I call Whoa. it, is, like John Schofield or Robin, okay, uh, Mike Landau, where when John Schofield plays, you don't hear any influences left. It's every single note is one hundred percent John Schofield. You know, he and Robin too, really. Um, um, he even argued with me about this one night <laughs> when we were having some drinks because he said Eric Johnson is just Eric Johnson, and I said, well. No, I think you're more just Robin Ford than Eric Johnson is just Eric Johnson. Because Eric, you can tell he does like a bit of Jimmy still, a yeah. bit of Jeff Beck, the reference is there. But Robin, it's just Robin yeah. when he plays. And uh, he disagreed, but I still maintain that he, he's got that thing where you're not like, oh, it's Robin doing a bit of BB or it's yeah. Robin doing a bit of Albert Collins or something. I think so. younger, younger listeners 
will hear Eric Johnson and say he sounds like lots of other guitar players, except, of course, the they truth is sound, they all sound like him. Yeah, but I can <laughs> still pick out when Eric Johnson's doing his, like, Cream Clapton vibe. Yeah, yeah. Even his rig, really, is, like, built off the way... He just took like three of his influences and used their each one mm. of their rigs as like an entire. You know, he does his check and stuff. Of course, it all sounds like Eric Johnson as well. Yeah. But it's easier to spot the, the, um, the roots of each bit of the style. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, Robin just only sounds like Robin John Schofield and Mike Lando. Interestingly, for such a versatile session guy who can play on yep. anything, when he does his own stuff. It just sounds like Mike Landau, you know. He still has some Jimmy in there, doesn't he? Sometimes, you know. But these day, these days, like less and less. So, um, so that's end level boss. Really, is where you you don't have any remnants of your of your heroes. You you are yeah. one yourself. And that's going to become yeah. more and more impossible just the longer the electric guitars on the planet, isn't it? Well, it is. How the, are you? Yeah. And the electric blues now are the branches of our trees yeah. so yeah. big that you, you're. You're fighting a um, for a space in it, yeah. Yeah. So. Let, let's have a little. Yeah. Uh, st- I know this is a little bit unfair on you because this is the first time you've uh, even tried this super black. I think. Oh isn't yeah. It? But, so Harry. But let, let's plug this in. We've got a we've got a new pedal from uh, uh, from Mad Professor that is very sort of fendery with nods towards old blackface amplifiers. Yeah. But if I'm honest with you, I don't know what it does. Let's just stop <laughs> on it and see what it sounds like. It's uh, right. Well, it definitely uh, has the steelier Fender uh, scoop in there as well. Probably the kind of thing that I would uh, use for, like we were talking about flying in and ending up with a couple of backline amps. Yeah. Um, that, um, I mean, certainly like your average DeVille and stuff, it, it, they don't sound like old Fender amps, in, just even in the way they're EQ'd. They're, yeah. It's that flatter sort of sound. Softer. More forgiving, yeah. basically, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. So this is that steely thing, but you can... I think there's a drive in there. Honestly, I've not even got, I've got no idea. Something like that. Well, that sounds great. It's got that thing. There we go. And I should mention the trim as well, shouldn't yes. I? Because that's super cool. And actually, Kevin Henretta, who makes these, he just he did actually make one with two knobs on that arrived just before I left, so I haven't had a chance to put it on there. Because I thought, well, maybe I'd use some different trim sounds. But the cool thing is it's like the bias tremolo. It's not like a hard, choppy one. So it's really got a nice, soft sort. Simple as that, really. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and of course, as long as you buy, you know, basically the Reunion Blues gig bag, the Kurt Mangan strings and one of these pedals, you too will sound exactly the same as Matt. Just Schofield. that simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, man, it's been amazing having you on. Um, Thank you for having me. I must recommend everybody. I'll put links in the description below. But yes, if you want to find out about one of Matt's True Fire guitar courses, go mm. check that out. If you want to see him in concert again, go to his website, find out where he's playing. Of course, big back catalogue of music now that people can go and... Anything new coming? Yeah, this record I started last year, you know, I've been procrastinating a little bit and and, um, some of it's my fault, some of it's intentional, uh, some of it's uh, the industry's fault, lots of reasons that it's not out yet, but uh, (laughs) I'm almost there. I think I got to... I, uh, I made the terrible mistake of thinking that I could 
do the session and then go on tour and be away for ages and come back to it three months later when I was home and go in and sing it, you know, because we did all the playing, but, and the further away you get from it, the harder it is to go back to it. So that's one of my... So when do you think roughly that'll be? Next year. Okay. Uh, early as next year. Hopefully I'm, early home, I'm home again next month, so I'm planning to get it, the, getting a, sticking a fork in it and saying done, you know? So. Well, I'm super looking forward to seeing you tonight. Thanks, mate. Thank, Thank you very much for coming man. in. Thank you guys for watching as always. Please like and subscribe, and we shall see you in a video probably tomorrow. Bye. Cheers. Thank you.